Hey guys, it's Lion here with Hobbies of Man. Once again, and today we're going to be doing another Wheel of Time review. Today we're going to be looking at the last portion of The Shadow Rising, the last 14-ish uh, chapters. And uh, I'm going to be honest with you guys, at this point I'm kind of way beyond this part of the story. So even though I, I wrote a lot of notes, this might be a shorter episode. Uh, well, I say that and then I probably will end up making it longer than usual. But um, at this point in my kind of reading journey... Uh, through the Wheel of Time, I'm actually 20 chapters into The Lord of Chaos. Um, and that's because I managed to get myself a uh, Audible credit, immediately spent it on The Lord of Chaos, and I've been slowly listening through, uh, you know, to it or through it. Uh, and uh, I'm really enjoying that part of the story, but I'm, I'm kind of really far removed from what, I, what I'm, I'm going to be talking about today. So uh, I need to stop reading that and actually catch up in terms of videos. Uh, so hopefully this will be the start of that. So maybe I'll, I'll record all of the videos I have for the Wheel of Time uh, in one go right now. So uh, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, my general thoughts about this part of the story is that everything was pretty great. I really loved all three of the stories that were presented in this book uh, and uh, all had really great moments. There was a lot of interesting characters and uh, in general, everything ended satisfyingly as in each storyline ended in a good point. It got there well. However, the fact that it ended uh, is not satisfying in the sense that where we finished or where we stopped at this point of the story was good. However, in the structure of a book, it didn't feel satisfying to read these conclusions uh, and then not have anything left. Like it felt lackluster is the best way to, to kind of put it. And I think that's just because the way that Robert Jordan writes endings uh, feels like, okay, I don't really care too much about this stuff. I just have to have it for the book. So let's make it as quick as possible and let's make the resolution to it quick so that we can get on to the next part of the story. And I think that it works, but I really wish there was a little bit more of a like a Sander Lanch type of vibe to it where it all kind of crescendos. And the thing is that it does. It does kind of rise to the moment, but then the moment ends too quickly. And I think that there's not enough uh, epicness that surrounds these big final cl climactic moments of the book. And uh, this isn't something that I only experienced here. Uh, I also experienced it in the next book and I'm probably gonna experience it in The Lord of Chaos. Um, but it's just kind of the way he writes, at least in this part of the story. Um, and I don't remember feeling unsatisfied with the way the earlier books ended. So I think this is just kind of like a growing pain that Jordan goes through. And I might be the only person that thinks this, I don't know. So um, yeah, I like the endings on their own in terms of like their own merit for their own stories. Uh, but I didn't think that in the structure of a book, uh, it felt satisfying. Like I wasn't excited by the end. I wasn't like, oh man, that was so good. It was more like, oh, that ended? Why? You know, so it, 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 it's kind of difficult to explain, but yeah, let's get into the rundown here. So uh, this part starts with uh, Egyanin, uh meeting up with Nynaeve and Elaine and helping them on the street. Uh, this is when they're kind of being followed and then they start fighting someone with a cl uh, with a, with cudgels, I think. And Egyanin steps in and uses her Shan Chan Kung Fu moves, uh, or maybe they're like uh, Hakai uh, uh, Akaido. I'm, I'm not really sure, but uh, she uses these moves in order to to kind of get rid of them, uh, to get rid of these people that are attacking the girls. Uh, and, uh, well, they invite her for tea and they have kind of this good, you know, relationship with each other. They find out uh, that they're uh, interested in each other. They like each other as people, they become friends. Uh, and uh, then uh, Mogadine shows up and she messes up uh, with the girls a little bit and then we move on to the tower where Swan uh, is dealing with back, bad bookkeeping and, and um, this El Elida shows up and proceeds to you know create a coup and remove Swan forcefully from the, 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 the Amberlin seat uh, and removes her shawl and this starts this revolt and then uh, she's removed from the office. Min enters amid the chaos and actually I do want to point something out here. Uh, it is that Swan actually sees uh, her warder die, but it doesn't feel like she feels it. And this is something I was gonna bring up later, but I'll bring it up now because I forgot that this part of the story happened here. Then it is this. A lot of people have told me that the warders and the Aes Sedai have this relationship that is closer than marriage, that is this ridiculously, you know, kind of entwined feeling. 
But so far, we have not seen that. Swan gets angry, but she doesn't become like, like her anger doesn't feel supernatural or it doesn't feel like justified for what I've been told is a super sacred, very meaningful bonding experience or bonding of these souls, right? Of this order and this Aes Sedai. It really felt like, oh, I'm angry that you killed my friend. It doesn't like go beyond that. And I think that that's a little bit weak, especially because uh, now that we're having the show uh, and the show is trying to convey this crazy like, you know, joining of souls between Warder and Aes Sedai, we're not actually being shown that in the book. So I'm not really sure where they got that. Uh, and I'm only mentioning this because the show wasted a lot of time with uh, Stepan and, uh, and Karine and their relationship when it doesn't seem like it's that important. I don't know. Like, I, it's kind of like a meta issue, I guess. Like, I have an issue with this because it shows something and then it doesn't match with the show. And then the show uh, makes it worse. It like kind of makes the issue more apparent to me. And so I'm kind of having this commentary, but uh, maybe it is not necessarily correct of me to have this argument or this kind of point of view because they are separate entities. And also because uh, maybe, you know, Swan and her warder weren't really that close, which she actually does mention. She says, you know, that she had a warder, but the thing was that she often sent him away because she couldn't, like there was no reason for her to have him. And so she used him as an agent to do missions. But um, even then, if you're supposed to have this crazy bond, I feel like she would have been a little bit angrier than she was when she saw him get killed, right? So I don't know, it's not that important, but it is something that kind of bothers me. Uh, and yeah, so Min enters in the chaos. She's helped by Gawain. And at this point in the story, was actually having a lot of difficulty telling Gawain and Galad apart, or Galad, uh, and that gets resolved later in the next book, uh, or actually, yeah, actually in the next book, it does get resolved for me. But at this point, I wasn't really sure which one was which. They both like Elaine, uh, and they're both good at sword fighting. I'm not really sure which one's which. I know that one of them has like a weird, like, intransigent way of looking at rules and the other one doesn't, but I'm not sure which one's which. However, Gawain, this one is the one that's actually related to, to Elaine, uh, the one that is uh, her full brother, not her half brother. So he's the son of Morgays. Uh, and he he helps Min get into the castle. Then we see that Swan and Leanna, or Leanne, uh, Leanne, I, I don't know how to say her name, but uh, you know, the 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 keeper of the, of the words or whatever, uh, are stilled. And then Min gets them out with the help of the cook lady or something. And, and uh, they leave, they manage to escape. Uh, again, thanks to Gawain, who actually wants to kill Swan and Leanne, uh, but cho chooses not to, because ultimately I think he, he needs them so he can find Elaine because no one else knows where she is. Uh, so he decides not to kill them. Uh, and I think it's mostly as a favor to Min, but you know, they move on from there. Eventually, they also find Loghain, and so Loghain joins them, and I can't wait for Loghain to meet Rand, because it hasn't happened yet, and I, I want that to happen, especially because the show seems to be making that a really big, important point way earlier in the series, and I want to know about that before I get into the show, right? So, uh, I don't know, but it works out pretty well, uh, and uh, yeah, then we move on to the IEO Waste, where Avienda teaches Rand as they travel, and it doesn't seem to be working that well. Avianda, Avienda is a great character. I really like her a lot, but uh, she rarely functions in the way that we're told she's supposed to be functioning, as in, yes, she's a maiden in the spear. Yes, she has all of the things that mean that, but she's also transitioning. She's kind of in this liminal space into becoming a wise one, but also her single task is to teach Rand how to be Aiel, and I feel like she, fails miserably at this task because she's busy doing other things like uh, protecting Rand from women so that he is Elaine's. Uh, and it works out, I like it. I really enjoy how this develops their relationship. But at the same time, I'm like, well, I kind of want to actually learn about Aiel properly. And it would be really nice to have Avienda actually teach Rand and then have Rand kind of take those teachings into himself and turn them into something meaningful and something useful for himself uh, going forward, right? But we don't ever actually get to see that. So it's a little bit disappointing there. Um, but overall, it's fine. Uh, then um, then they arrive at Cold Rocks uh, and uh, they 
uh, ask for entrance. They ask uh, Ruach's wife, the one that is a, a home uh, a homekeeper, a housekeeper, I think. I can't remember the name. A roofkeeper, a roof mistress, I think is, is what it's called. Uh, if they can enter, she gives them permission, permission and she actually snuffs Kool it in. And Rand accidentally makes uh, a good kind of thing here by asking for permission in a very uh, kind of humble way compared to what would be uh, the correct way for the chief of chiefs to ask. And so he gains a little bit of points with the woman and also through that with the rest of the people. And so I enjoy this. Then they have this really nice dinner, although they kind of eat it laying down, which is a really awkward uh, way of eating. I, I, I don't know if that's good for digestion, but you know, if it's a cultural thing, it doesn't matter. But the food that they eat is actually really, really interesting. I, I'm, I'm Texan, I'm actually from Mexico, uh, and Mexico and Texas have a very kind of specific type of food. And a lot of the things that the Aiel seem to be eating are very similar to those types of food and Southwestern food in general. So I really enjoy that. It seems like there's something that's basically uh, chili or guisado, uh, if you know what that is, I'll put a picture up uh, of that now so you guys can see what it is, which is a, a chili sauce with meat in it. Uh, they have corn, they have tomatoes, they have prickly pears. I actually just recently had some prickly pears because they're in season right now. And they're insanely delicious. If you guys are uh, so people that have not tried them but have them available in your in your local uh, supermarkets, I recommend you guys eat them. They're basically a very like sweet cucumber kind of feeling type of thing. They have a lot of seeds and it kind of adds a nice crunchy texture, but uh, they're not necessarily the, like the seeds themselves are not that good at eating, but um, I really enjoy this aspect, this kind of culture that they have because, uh, you know, everything about them kind of screams like Irish, but also like Middle Eastern. And then suddenly having this kind of like Native American, Southwestern, Tex-Mex kind of thing uh, makes them really interesting. And I really enjoy that about uh, Robert Jordan's writing. I like how that kind of works, right? So yeah, they have this like political talk uh, and then Rand gets a gift for Avienda and the shield maidens or the, the, spear, uh, the spear sisters, uh, the spear maidens, uh, I think that Rand is actually trying to court Avienda and so they help him uh, because I think they just think it's good that the chief of chiefs wants to be with one of them and they're taking advantage of the fact that Avienda is technically not one of them anymore even though she kind of falls into their camp. Uh, and this also starts the relationship between Rand and the Fardas Ma uh, Fardas Mize, which uh, is actually really meaningful for later on. So I really enjoy that there. And then uh, they go to bed and they're attacked by Jarkar. Uh, and uh, this battle is short but meaningful. And then we see that the Shido are gone. And so Rand has to uh, go to al Qair Dal in order to, to get there as fast as possible, uh, in order to avoid as many problems as he can with the fact that the Shido have gotten there first. So uh, yeah, then we go back to Tanchiko, the girls are eating, uh, Doman enters, and then he has a fight with Egyanin, Ag Ag uh, where she's out as a, as a Sean Chan. And I thought this is a really good kind of moment because yes, as the reader, we already knew that she was a Sean Chan, but Egwene, or sorry, Nynaeve and Elaine did not. And they had this basically this kind of, uh, this breach in their trust. And I thought that was really, really good. I really enjoyed that because uh, of the simple fact that they're like, damn, we didn't know that you were one of these people. We liked you, we still like you. And we're really angry at this like perceived treachery um, because you're, uh, you know, Sean Chan are basically all evil, uh, or at least that is kind of the perception that they have. Uh, and it makes it really difficult for them to deal with it. So I really enjoy that. And I think that the friction it has between the relationship is quite good. I liked it a lot. I thought it was well done for, for, for sure. It was really, really enjoyable. Uh, then we have Nynaeve meeting Egwene uh, and Amis and Briar uh, at the uh, Dreamland. Uh, and then they find... Uh, something, I can't remember what it was, but uh, Brigitte talks to uh, Nynaeve and warns her about Mogadine. Uh, and then uh, they find uh, this this uh, this control tool, this uh, kind of Adam uh, that works on men. So this is exactly what the Black Aja is looking for and what Egwene and Nynaeve and Elaine were actually looking for as well. So they need to find it, they need to get rid of it. Uh, and uh, it's important that they find this out, right? So then we're back to Emmons Field where a message arrives that says we are coming. And actually it doesn't say, it's actually a person that manages to run through the Trolla camps, manages to survive just long enough to tell Perrin we are coming. And it's kind of ominous feeling initially 
but it later it turns out to be actually a really, really good thing. So uh, that works out really, really nicely there. Loyal and Gaul also return. Uh, and uh, then uh, we get to see uh, Lord Luck or Lord Luke, uh, Luke uh, show up and uh, sow some discord again, as he does. Uh, and then uh, Perrin Wolf Dreams in order to do some recon uh, of the area to see what's going on. And it turns out that Loyal and Gaul were correct and that Luck uh, or Luck or whatever his name is was trying to, to kind of lie to make them unprepared right so uh yeah and then he marries uh fail in order to show her his love but also just in case he doesn't manage to survive the oncoming attack and then he sends her off somewhere else so i think that's what happens there uh then we come back to the girls who enter the the panarch's palace they split up and uh, elaine actually manages to uh save amethira the pawn and the panarch while I need looks for the angry elves that she found, uh, and, and it ends up battling Mogadine. I really enjoy this part of the story because the conflict between the two of them is great and also sets up Nynaeve to be a really meaningful fighter. Like, yes, we know Nynaeve is a good character. We know that she's important to Rand and the other Emin Fielders, but we haven't really gotten an, a great impression of her as a fighting force, as a person that is going to be relevant to the to the fighting of the of the of the a story yet and this is the first time that she really manages to do that well and i really enjoyed it however this does then lead into some of the story points later and i'm not going to talk about it here but uh it kind of changes my my feelings a little bit later on but at the point in reading this i was very 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 excited about this because it was really cool to see Nynaeve uh, manage to use ingenuity to beat uh, mogadine right so yeah, overall, uh, really good stuff there. Then we got a little bit of a lore dump as the battle happens. Uh, she wins, and then um, they escape. And uh, Amethira uh, gets taught a little bit of humility, humility by having to work uh, at, at this uh, inn for a few days. And then they dump the, the, the angry all collar into the ocean, and uh, hopefully no one will ever find it, right? And so uh, then uh, the seal is sent over to Tarvalin, uh, and uh, back to Evans Field, we get to see that Fail uh, is sent away, an attack is coming, the preparations are complete, and then the battle starts. Uh, and it's a really, really good fight. I really enjoyed this part of the story. I love Perrin's character, and this probably is my favorite book so far just because I like Perrin's story so much. I really, really enjoy uh, what we have going on here. So, uh, yeah, eventually, uh, you know, backup arrives, and it's because Fail. Uh, uh, Fael uh, managed to lie to uh, Perrin without lying to him, and so she was sent off to Camelin, but actually just ended up going to the other outlying uh, villages and brought the men back into uh, the fight, and so that way we can have a kind of a new version of the Manetherian uh, kind of uh, or Manetherian uh, fight, where the woman and the children and everyone fights, uh, and then uh, this time help does arrive and so they manage to win and so what happens here then is that uh, once they manage to win um the white cloaks are like hey man you said you're gonna go with us if uh, we, we we helped you and then it's like uh, well you didn't actually help us so uh, fuck you you know <laughs> leave uh and uh it worked out pretty well i think the white cloaks were chased off a little bit too easily but i think it's because at this point pat and fane or ordieth uh, Ordith, uh, was gone. He went somewhere else, I think, at this point. So uh, there was no one really pushing uh, to to do that. And uh, Borhal or whatever, the other guy that hates Perrin with a, with a passion, uh, is a little bit too honorable to, to kind of uh, not uphold his end of the bargain. Um, so uh, especially once Perrin realizes the trick, right? So uh, that was a little bit too clean for me. But like I said, it is kind of the way that uh, Jordan kind of deals with the final resolutions of his story. So it works out, but it's a little bit too clean for me. And, you know, we are getting to the point where it's longer than usual. Uh, this is a longer video than usual. So it is what it is. Now we're back to the waste where uh, the maidens are actually now Rand's honor guard. And this uh, is uh, meaningful. This comes directly from Avienda's uh, relationship with Rand. And also it seems to be because Rand has a connection with these uh, women uh, that he is not completely aware of, but that they are. And so they kind of are happy to have, you know, a a, a member of, of their family, basically, of their clan that is male, uh, stay with them. And so they're very happy 
to, to have him and to be his honor guard. So I like that. Uh, and then they leave for al and um, then the Tardad, Ayil, join them on the journey. They arrive, there's five different clans there, and the Shido are making trouble. Of course, that's what they do. So Ran descends into this uh, kind of like weird Mesa Valley thing that looks like a bowl. And he shows up, and then there's a little bit of politicking happening here. Uh, and Rand manages to disarm all arguments against being the Karakarn because he explains the truth. He tells them what is seen in Ruiden. And when um, when Kuladin can't uh, support that, when he can't say the same thing, they all know that Rand is the Karakarn. He is the Dragon Reborn. And so they side with him. And this actually leads to conflict because... Uh, certain Aiel don't want to admit that, and so they go with the Shido. And then other Aiel uh, realize that they are Oathbreakers. They have always been Oathbreakers. Their culture is basically Oathbreaking, uh, even though their culture is actually very heavily against Oathbreaking. And so they encounter this new phenomenon called the Bleak, which is kind of uh, a breaking of your of their cultural, religious uh, reality uh, that leads them to be uh, un unhappy and actually leave the waste. Uh, and so it's pretty interesting. I quite like that. I thought it was uh, very well done. Uh, and then uh, Lanfear appears. And uh, I'm not actually sure what happens here. I think Lanfear tells Rand, hey, Asmodian is using this in order to go get something from, from Rudian. And you need him because he's the only male uh, channeler that can teach you because he's the only one that is weak enough for you to actually kind of beat, especially with my help. And so Rand portals away to uh, Asmodian and they have a fight. And this fight is really quick and also a little bit confusing, but eventually uh, uh, Rand uses his Angrio and, and manages to beat Asmodian. Um, so now what happens is that uh, Rand manages to sever the bond Asmodian has to the Dark One, which is pretty cool. That might actually need to help to help him get rid of the taint that uh, is left on Sidene. I'm not really sure, but I can see that being connected there. And then uh, he manages to take Asmodian as a teacher and confronts Lanfear uh, or Lanfear, and then returns to Al Kardal. And this is a very quick and very uh, simply finalized story. And again. The issue is that everything just feels a little bit too clean. Like, yes, there was a big conflict. Yes, there was a fight. But there's no real revelation to the fight. There was no, like, give and take. It was all more or less like, okay, it was hard, but not that hard. And so Rand win, wins, right? And this kind of is the case for Nynaeve's story too. But this is the first time that Nynaeve does something of this level. So I kind of allow it to happen. But whereas with Rand, at this point, he's fought like five different people, like every book he fights someone. And um, this one feels a lot less satisfying than the previous ones. And so that's kind of my, my, my situation there. But overall, really good book. I really enjoyed this one. Parent storyline is probably my favorite so far. Uh, although I do really enjoy the IEO, especially with context now of what happens in later books. I really enjoy their storyline too. But uh, Nynaeve is definitely my, 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 my favorite female character. And Perrin is currently my favorite male character. So there, there we go. That's it for The Shadow Rising. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please do a like, subscribe, and comment down below. Let me know what you thought. And thank you guys very much for watching. And see you guys later.